Good night, brothers and sisters, everyone who is going to be uh, joining me for this um, live discussion. Where, whether you're a friend, you're a foe, you are just curious. For whatever reason, you'll be um, joining me for this um, discussion, watching this video presentation. Um, I hope that you are in health. I hope that God has been keeping you and your families. And I trust that you are doing extremely, extremely well. So as uh, y'all should know, I'm, I'm doing this series on um, Adventism, deconstructing Adventism. And so I think this is about the, the third or fourth installment, maybe fifth. I've, I've lost count. But yes, I've been doing these um, teachings for the past couple of weeks. And um, I've been getting a lot, of, a lot of great feedback from them. Persons have really been enjoying them. And so you can be sure every week, God's willing, um, I'll be here with uh, one of these for you to think about, to ruminate on, to, to chew on, to look into, to refute. If you think that what I'm presenting is erroneous, to refute. Um, or do whatever you want with it. If you just want information with regards uh, to Adventism, um, that's all good. So... Uh, it's a little bit of noisy around me. I hope you can hear me a little well, though. There's a party going on um, uh, next door. But I hope you can hear me well enough. I'm doing my best to, um, to shut out the noise and to project very well. So I hope that um, uh, it's not disturbing you. But um, let me just wait for a few folk to get on, and then we're going to get right into it. I see some of y'all on already. God bless y'all. Um, Brother Kwame there. Pastor Corey Jenkins, CMB. God bless you, bro. Thank you so much for joining this evening. I see um, Reverend Sean Major Campbell. I see um, <clears throat> there's, uh, yes, Kevin, one of my other good friends and brother, Kevin Hughes. Nice to have you, bro. Um, Jonathan Hawkins. God bless you, bro. Thank you so much for joining, for coming on. And of course, some of you are incognito, so I'm not able to see you. And you're, you're free, you're free to um, be incognito as well. Um, just take a quick minute, guys. Um, invite some folks to come on. Um, those who, you know, who you wanted to, um, to see these, just invite them to, to um, get on in here. We're going to have a good one tonight. Tag them, share the, share the, the, the video on your, po on your post, on your page, uh, in uh, pages you're in or whatever, you, who you think may um, uh, be blessed by it so that they can get this information as well. Um, I appreciated that, that you don't mind, given the fact that, you know, I, I, I don't have the means to, to do um, the PowerPoints and that kind of thing. It's mostly talking, you know, <laughs> and I'm just reading the information to you. But you like it anyway, you enjoy it anyway, and you understand that everybody's circumstances are different, and you accept what I have to bring to the table as is, and not try to pressure me for what I can't deliver. So I appreciate that. God bless you all for that. Um, Brother Joey Braxton, God bless you, bro. Sister Donna Collins, all the way in Australia. A whole day ahead. God bless you, sis. Brother Je uh, Gersides Jerry, God bless you. God bless you. Uh, Karim Williams, God bless you, bro. So nice to have all of you all. Um, Emilio Toro II, God bless you. Thank you for, um, for, for joining. Um, so... Yeah, let, let, let's get to it because, you know, I don't want to keep you too long, guys, and I want to give you all the information I got tonight. Um, this is going to be the last major one on Ellen White, <clears throat> so I want to get to it. So we're looking at Ellen White, uh, unbiblical teachings, absurdities, and questionable things. Uh, you know, when, when you listen to SDAs, especially the fanatical ones talk about Ellen White, you would think that that Ellen White was an impeccable saint, that she has never made a mistake in her life, that the crazy things she said, they're all justified in some way or form, that, um, you know, she, she's no different from the biblical prophets um, um, and authors, uh, etc. Uh, so so you're, you're, you're going to see that, that Ellen White is a kind of, kind of person, one of those nutcase uh, 18th century 1800, rather, 20th century, persons and prophets you want to stay away from. 
Adventists do their best to present Ellen White like she's impeccable. She knew it all. Everything was 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 screwed on upstairs and all her medical stuff. Uh, she had all over two thousand prophecies and you know everything came true so far and 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 you know she's the most translated author, female author, and uh, you name it. A whole lot of ways they seek to exaggerate um, who Ellen White was, but they will never either tackle or be honest about the crazy things about Ellen White. And where I stand biblically. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. In Ellen White's case, there's about 90 to 99% of leaven and 1% dough. It's horrible. Throw it out. Now, I don't care who's deceived by her, how big and monolithic the organization that's behind her, how much smart people believe in her and push her or whatever. That's their thing. Right? They could do their thing. But where scripture is concerned, that's where I stand. Where history is concerned, where the facts are concerned, where orthodox Christianity is concerned, that's where I stand, and I reject that. I reject her. I reject what they propose as a result of her disagreeing so much and having such crazy things where scripture and salvation is concerned. Now, here's, here's one to, to, to start tonight off. In, in early writings, page 39, paragraph 2, Ellen White says, All the angels that are commissioned to visit the earth hold a golden card which they present to the angels at the gates of the city as they pass in and out. All the angels that are commissioned to visit the earth hold a golden card which they present to the angels at the gates of the city as they pass in and out. So this is sort of like a passport, this golden card where Ellen White is concerned that these angels have. When they are leaving heaven, leaving the heavenly city to come here, they have to present their passport which is this golden card to the angel at the gate and they exit when they return they must present this golden card again for them to be able to enter into the holy city uh but this 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 uh, uh statement and this view beloved friends you will not find it anywhere in scripture you're not going to find anywhere in scripture where it speaks of uh, angels who are traveling in and out of heaven carry a golden card as some sort of passport to grant them exit and entry into heaven uh, for them to have access to. You're not going to ever find it. This is, this is fanciful. This is wishful. This is all made up, conjured up from her imagination. As a matter of fact, <laughs> it's not even original to her. She plagiarized it from William Foy. <laughs> she plagiarized it from William Foy. And so it is, it is not true. The Bible does not teach that the angels need a golden card as a pass to get in and out of heaven. You're not going to find that in scripture. In early writings, page 18, uh, uh, paragraph 50 and, and, uh, and 53, sorry, pages 18 and 53, sorry. She says, and I quote, And I saw the little ones climb, or if they chose, use their little wings and fly to the top of the mountains and pluck the never fading flowers. In early writings, one of her books, this is the earliest book of Ellen White. She saw the little children using their wings to fly to the tops of mountains and pick never fading flowers. Again, you're not going to find anything in scripture where the pre-sin, in-sin and post-sin, any, any sort of theology where, where human beings had wings currently have wings or will have wings you're not going to find that but here she says little children they um had wings and they they were able to use them to fly to, to high mountains and to pick flowers you're not going to find this fanciful stuff uh in scripture you're never going to find it never the only thing i see in scripture that humans are going to have in the hereafter um is actually a crown is a victor's crown they're going to have. Revelation talks of that. Uh, uh, James, uh, Peter, throughout the New Testament, they talk about us receiving a, re uh, receiving a crown of righteousness. And Paul talks about the two that God is going to give to all of us. But in terms of wings, Scripture doesn't teach that humans had wings or will have wings with which they can fly. So she says children would have wings. On page 53, she says also adults, the saints will have wings. 
She says, then the saints used their wings and mounted to the top of the walls of the city. So the saints are going to use their wings to fly, to sit on top of the wall of the city or to, you know, fly over it. But this is fanciful stuff. It is not scripture. It is not biblical. Um, 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 and, and of course, I have to reject it. The only beings scripture present as having wings are like the seraphims, the cherubims, um, angels. Some are two wings, some have four wings, some have six wings. That's all we see in scripture. But where in humans are concerned, we don't see any evidence of them having any sort of wings in scripture. This is fanciful. This is rubbish. And we ought to reject it. I see a whole lot of y'all joining way afterwards. God bless y'all. Thank you for coming on. Um, as you know, I don't like to lose trend of thought, so that's why I don't interact in the comments while I'm presenting. But I can, um, you know, respond after I finish. Uh, here's a law. Here, here, here's a wide range of other issues. They were too much to actually put the quotations and to read them to you that um, Ellen White spoke about. Uh, and of course, fact check me. Type them up, or if you need to, me or Colin, we can post the quotes or stuff for you. Where Ellen White is concerned. Pigs cause leprosy, and brothers and sisters, um, it's not scientifically possible, it's not medically possible. It, it, there's no evidence that should just suggest that pigs cause leprosy. But she says pigs cause leprosy. Um, masturbation causes cancers and hordes of other sicknesses, bald head, and you know the, the, the fairy tales of hair growing on your palm and, and, and um, expend your life force and life energy, and you're gonna die young and that kind of stuff. Yes. Um, uh, Ellen White had a lot of crazy stuff to say about masturbation. But beloved friends, masturbation don't cause those things. Excessive masturbation is not a good thing, yes. It can cause lethargy and, and a number of, you know, other things. Erectile dysfunction, especially if pornography gets in the picture. But in terms of, of um, healthy masturbation for single people, and I'm not uh, condoning masturbation here or whatever, we can have that conversation, uh, you know, some other time. But medically and scientifically, healthy masturbation, that is every once in a while uh, for men or women, if you are too pent up sexually uh, to release yourself through masturbation, it is good for you. It is good for the body. It keeps your, your, your instrument working. Uh, it releases a lot of endorphins and all kinds of stuff to keep your body healthy. It, it will not cause cancer. Your hair will not grow. Your, your, your hand will not grow palm for men. Um, you're not going to have spine disease. Ellen White has a variety of illnesses, she say, that is caused by masturbation. Even up to children that were two years old, um, back in her time, she claimed they went insane and parents had to put them in straight jacket because they, ma they were masturbating and were getting disease and deranging all kinds of stuff. That is absolute nonsense. Masturbation does not cause cancer and all of these uh, other diseases that Ellen White talk about. She says that black people came into being from amalgamation, that is, sex between humans and animals. Yes, Ellen White and the world at that time saw blacks, and remember, blacks were enslaved. She claimed that they were the product of amalgamation, sex between man and beast. And again, I've read the apologetic works. I've read the Adventist Defense League. Uh, I've read uh, 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 um, Francis D. Nichols, uh, Ellen White and the Critics. As I've read a prophet among you, and all the explanation are rubbish. As a matter of fact, I will deal with those quotes uh, in my upcoming book, her crazy things and statements. I'm going to deal with them to show that even if we take the explanation, it doesn't make sense because she, she claimed that it was the, 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 the greatest sin that the antediluvians committed, amalgamation of man and beast, and it defaced the image of God. Even if we take their view for it, like that, um, that was just sex between animals and, and, and humans and humans or whatever. But how did regular, how, how did animals deface the image of God when they're not made in the image of God to begin with? How did the humans deface the image of God if they were just intermarrying and, and having natural sex? All right? There are so many things that they, they will not answer. They create all these different red herrings and straw men, but they believe that that sex was a, a, a result uh, of um, the, the creation of black people. Remember, black, blacks weren't humans where they were concerned, right? So they saw blacks um, and, and, and the pygmies of Australia and certain Hottentots tribes of Africa as being the amalgamation of man and animal. And in her time, Colin, you could put up the quote for me. 
Uh, in her day, there was an Adventist apologist who defended the legitimacy of Ellen White's statement, along with Uriah Smith, that indeed she's correct and science proves it. And they had some other, uh, uh, some, you know, botched up scientific facts that they claim prove that it's sex between man and animals that gave birth to black people. The Adventists of her day who knew Ellen White, the Adventist pastor, an, ap an apologist, they were saying, yes, she's correct. It is sex between man and Animals that gave birth to black people. And so all this late uh, 1950s and 60s and current day stuff that these Adventist apologists are trying to foment and create to make her statement seem scientifically factual or explain it away, it does not do the job. Because when you go into the history and what they were defending, they were saying that she's right. Black people came as a result of sex between animals and humans. Uh, uh, other crazy stuff, uh, having late night conversations where Ellen White is concerned uh, will affect your morals. Now, in a sense, this is true. That is, if you are, uh, you know, engaging in, you know, the, the, the sort of late night calls and, you know, that kind of immoral stuff. But where she's concerned is not the content of conversation, but the fact of late night conversation. So irrespective of what you're talking about. She claims that it, it's going to affect your morals when that's not, that's not true at all. Sometimes late at night, I'm on the phone, uh, me with some of my friends from the, the UA Urban Apologist community, or I'm counseling somebody, three, four, five o'clock, or I'm writing, you know, a chapter in the book, I'm doing something. It's not affecting my morals, but where Ellen White is concerned, all of that is wrong. Uh, it's wrong to pray standing up, sitting, or lying down. Ellen White was confused as to, as to what's the correct position to pray. And she says it's wrong to pray in any of those positions. You know what you should do? You should always kneel. This is always the acceptable way to pray. That's what she said. But of course, then she'll flip-flop. You know, with Ellen White, anything goes, guys. And I'm not exaggerating. You can find one thing that says this and another thing that says the opposite. That, that was just Ellen White. She was stealing and plagiarizing so much she couldn't keep track of herself. And made a lot of crazy statements. This, this one was very legalistic. Um, it's wrong to have a car, life, or home insurance. Ellen White was big against insurance. It is wrong to have a bicycle. It is, it is sinful to eat cheese, spices, pastries. Uh, yes, I'm talking about cakes and all of those regular pastries. Yes, condiments such as, such as uh, ketchup and, and, and margarine and, and butter, um, uh, mustard, all of those condiments. Yes, salad dressing, where Ellen White is concerned. Those things are wrong, and they're going to animalize you, brothers and sisters. Uh, wearing weave. Ladies, hear me out. Hear me out. Hear me out, ladies, especially, especially my, my fellow uh, 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 black, black sisters. Here's what Ellen White has to say about this. And you know, some ladies love their weave and wigs. Wearing weave, wigs, or hair extensions will give you brain disease and cause insanity. This is what Ellen White says, and that is absolutely rubbish. That is a rubbish. Merely when these things do not cause these diseases. But Ellen White says they will cause that. Uh, it is wrong to have a union job or union membership. That is trade union. It's wrong to have a membership in a trade union or a job in a trade union. It is sinful to go to amusement parks, you know, like the neighborhood park, uh, uh, well, uh, 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 Disney and, and Disneyland and all those other parks. It, it is wrong and sinful to go to those places uh it is sinful to go to the theater you know the theater it is that's the movies when we go you watch a nice movie it's wrong ellen white as a matter of fact ellen white says your angel stands at the door it's too sinful to go in there your guardian angel stays at the door he folds his wing and and he's sad when you go into a theater crazy legalism uh, it is sinful to play any sport that involves a ball it is sinful to go bowling to play cricket it is sinful to play cards. Yeah, you think your all board games can get away? Card and Monopoly and all of those games. When you are an Ellen White reader and digester, your life, your Christian experience become a miserable drudge. Because as you read her, you think she is this ultimate inspired true prophetess of God. You're going to put all these things into practice. This is why majority of Adventists are straight list laced. They're extremists. They are killjoys. Uh, 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 the lives of these people are legalistic. They are judgmental. They're always nitpicking at the slightest things. Uh, uh, th this is why. This is why. Because of Ellen White. This is why they judge women if they have on makeup or a lipstick 
or a little hair coloring and it's all everything is a big problem because of Ellen White. So your board games and the cards, it's sinful to play those. It's sinful to play chess. It's sinful to play checkers or to participate in any sort of competition or sports whatsoever, or contests, beauty pageants, you name it. Th those are sinful where she's concerned. It's sinful to have a house where you put up curtains. Yes, I got curtains in my house. That, that, that's sinful where Ellen White was concerned. It is sinful to take pictures and have them in our homes. Yet, when you look at Ellen White, you'll see so much photographs of her. As a matter of fact, there's a photograph of her that has several photographs in the background of that photograph. <laughs> Ellen White has a lot of photographs that when she died, she actually donated to her sons. Well, she willed them uh, to her sons or whatever. And they're making big money off them today. Where a regular member was concerned, it was sinful to have all of these things. Uh, it, is, it is sinful to, to be fashionable. So, you know, some of us who like to be fashionable, you know, we stay up to date with the fashion. Where Ellen White is concerned, fashion is a sign of the last day. Fashion is a, is a tyrannical mistress. Uh, fashion will deplete your spirituality. I have hordes of statements on this. As a matter of fact, when I was an Adventist evangelist, I had a powerful, what I thought then was powerful Ellen White um, um, presentation I put up on dress. About 176 slides. I used to do it in two parts. In my evangelistic series, or when persons invite me to come to their church to present it. Looking at jewelry, hat wearing, pants wearing, lipstick, makeup, extensions, you name it. And I used to send it around and they, they thought it was the best. Where I'm showing that Ellen White, you know, has to say in all of these things and they're legalistic. And guess what? It's all unbiblical. It's all wrong. It's all wrong, brothers and sisters. Uh, it is sinful to wear a skirt that doesn't reach your ankles. Uh, the shape of one's head determines one character and personality. This is what they call uh, phrenology uh, in the 1800s, where you know they, they, they would examine, take, take um, people to physicians, uh, doctors, and they would examine their heads and the shape of it. They'll tell your character and who you are and you know that kind of stuff. She took her sons to, to get their, their heads examined to determine who they were. And, and, and she was satisfied with the results that you know they were of good character and they would be decent men and all that, that kind of stuff. But it's crazy. The shape of your head don't determine your character and your personality. It doesn't matter how your head shaped. That has no influence on your character and your uh, personality. The shape of your head, your physique, your physical features. Um, um, that is genetics. That's what that is. Your genes determine your phenotype. The genotype, which is the information that comes from your parents, your mother and your father, determine your physical build. Right? And your, your character and personality is coming from your genes as well. Your parents, they pass on traits to you and your environment and the things you read and feed yourself spiritually will determine your character, your personality, and your attitude. But just being born like this shape of my head here, it, it says nothing about who I am as a person. It says nothing about me, my, my, my personality, or my character, my morality, nothing. But Ellen White believed that. She took her sons to get all that stuff done. I tell you, stay away from, stay away from her. Stick with your Bible alone. Stick with your Bible alone. Here are some other stuffs. Now, some other stuff. Some of you may wonder, well, why is Adventism, why are Adventists so mean, so angry, so judgmental, so condemning, just so unpleasant in general towards the wider body of Christ, towards Christians? Why do they have so much beef with the Catholic Church and with Protestant Christianity. Well, it's because of all the nasty and mean stuff that Ellen White has to, had to say about um, non-Adventist Christians. Ellen White, Ellen White was a drudge. This is why you, you could say in some cases they hate Protestant Christianity so much, especially those of us who go to church on Sunday. Adventism had, has a deep-seated aversion towards the wider body of christ and this is the reason jason would say yard man stops <laughs> you don't know how i'd go chasing <laughs> you know sometimes these days come on up uh, let me read some quotes to you as to how they think about us and of course there are some other cute little nice quotes too that they think you know god has chased children in, in in these churches but at the same time you know they still don't see us as being legitimately a part of the body of christ they see us as just being these deceived pagans who need their gospel to come out of our pagan churches to be saved. 
That's how they see it. And those who are in who are sincere don't know better. They rule it in ignorance. You know, at the time of ignorance, God winks and then God is going to call his people out of Babylon, Catholicism and these Sunday churches to come into Adventism. Ellen White was a meanie towards um, the wider body of Christ. In early writings, page 116, paragraph 1, she says, I saw that the nominal churches, meaning the Sunday churches, have fallen. That coldness and death reign in their midst. This is what she had to say about us. Our churches are fallen and the coldness and death reign in our midst. Now, is it true of some churches, some apostate churches, in the sense that they are not orthodox? Um, they are teaching a lot of unbiblical stuff. They are focused more on the world and, and, and pleasing the world and that kind of stuff. Yes, it is true of some churches who are under false teachers and cultic organizations. But it's not true of the entire body of Christ simply because they are not Seventh-day Adventists. What Ellen White is saying here is because they're not Seventh-day Adventists and they rejected the Advent message from William Miller and then the Adventists. And then this is what she concludes about us. They have fallen coldness and death reign in their midst, our Sunday churches. In Testimonies, Volume 4, page 13, paragraphs 2 to 3, she says, The sins of the popular churches are whitewashed over. Interesting how the GC and the Ellen White trustees have been whitewashing her like crazy. But hey, she feels like we are whitewashed. The sins of the popular churches are whitewashed over. Many of the members indulge in the grossest vices and are steeped in iniquity. The most revolting sins of the age find shelter beneath the cloak of Christianity. Their conduct is abhorrent to the Lord. They are co-workers with the adversary of souls. We are working with Satan. Now again, can you find some churches, some people among us who are like this? Absolutely. But to, 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 to blanket all of us as this way by virtue of not being Adventists is, is wrong. The fact is, this, can, this is descriptive of, of, of Adventism too. A lot of the immoralities that go on in some Sunday churches, Christian churches, the same thing happened in Adventism. But where they are concerned, all of that, they are still a remnant. They are still a true church. The act of us going to church on Sunday and holding to what they call these pagan and unbiblical doctrines make us like this. Our sins are whitewashed over. We're steeped in vices and iniquity. Revolting sins. Find shelter under the cloak of Christianity. Our conducts are, are abhorrent to God. And we are working with Satan himself. In early writings, page 274, she says, I saw great iniquity and vileness in the churches, yet their members profess to be Christians. Their profession, their prayers, and their exhortations are an abomination in the sight of God. This is horrendous. Ellen White is throwing everybody under the bus here. Our profession, our prayers, and our exhortations, our preaching and teaching, it's an abomination to God. Jesus and the angels look upon them in anger. Jesus is constantly angry with, with the church, his bride. Can you imagine? Can you imagine, beloved? Jesus is constantly angry with the body of Christ. An innumerable host of evil angels, Lord have mercy are spreading over the whole land and crowding the churches. So, so the churches now are the habitation of evil angels. The, the, the wider body of Christ is, 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 is uh, our present profession and exhortation is an ab ab abomination. Jesus is angry with us and the host of evil angels, they are all over the land and they crowd in our churches. This is what he's saying. It's unfortunate, but this is how they see us. And that's why they have the attitude they have towards us. I'm going to talk about that in one of these episodes, about a, the elitistic mindset of Adventism. We're going to talk about it. This is deconstructing Adventism. But I got a later foundation, and I can deal with everything that come to my mind or that you present to me to talk about. In uh, manuscript releases uh, 19, volume 19, page 176, paragraph 1, she says, Non-Adventist churches don't have God's favor. They have no vitality or consecration to God, and they will receive God's plagues. This is what Ellen White and Adventists, who take her serious, and the Adventist church itself, think about us, our churches. Yet they are doing the same things or worse. The church has been doing abortion from, what, the 1950s and at the Adventist church. 
even the resolution they passed last year, it is it's still favoring abortion. They are trying to appease, you know, the ones who are against it in their midst, but it still allows room for abortion. Check out Pro Life Andrew on YouTube. He keeps up with that a lot, and he, he's, he's an Adventist, and he exposes these things a lot. In Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 425 and 444, she says, The secular powers and all of Christendom will enforce Sunday worship. They will severely torture, punish, and murder Seventh-day Adventists for refusing to worship God on Sunday. This is the Sunday law that they anticipate to come very soon. She had a lot of nasty things to say about the wider body of Christ. And that is why they think they are superior um, to Christians. They have this superior, you know, complex. They are better than us. The, their doctrines are dropped from heaven and dropped in their lap. And they are unapproachable. Their teachings are irrefutable. They are the elite remnant of God for the last days with a special message given to give to the world and the Christian churches to come out of error and darkness and come into the marvelous light of Adventism. That is why they have that mindset. Because of Ellen White, and it's very sad. That is why, on, on, by and large, they, they avoid working with non-Adventist churches. Even Sabbatarian churches, Adventists don't work with too tough. And that means they don't really, you know, they don't cozy with them. The Sunday churches... Some unions and conferences, you know, who are more enlightened and trying to shed off Ellen White will partner with evangelical churches. But in terms of the ones who take Ellen White seriously, and even those who are doing it are getting a lot of flack from the general conference and the wider membership. So they don't really partner with, with us in, in our work to save souls because our soul need, need more saving where they are concerned than, than those who don't know Christ. That is why over 90% of their evangelistic resources, financially and materials, are spent on targeting already Christians. This is what their research, as, uh, uh, um, the, the, the uh, statistics and archives uh, uh, are centered for SDA said. Over 90% of their resources are spent on trying to convert already Christians to Adventism because they see us as being more evil and wicked and vile and pagan. And more needing salvation than even those who don't even know Christ yet. This is the reason for it. Ellen White. Uh, let's look at some other matters, brothers and sisters. Ellen White and her dead husband. Adventists always use these proof texts here. Isaiah chapter 18, chapter 8 rather, verses 19 to 20, where it speaks about we shouldn't consult the dead on behalf of the living. They always use it to the law and to the testimony if they... Speak not according to this word is because there's no light in them. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 10 to 12. God forbid consulting the dead, witchcraft, divination, sorcery, spell casting, etc. And anyone who practiced them under the law was an abomination to the Lord. So scripture is clear on that. And they use these proof texts today to condemn us for our belief in, in the fact that man is a, at least a bipartite human being. That is... Uh, he has a physical body and a non-material spirit that survives the death of the body. Adventists call that spiritual, uh, 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 spiritualism. And they consider it to be one of the, uh, the major signs of the last days when the devil is going to deceive everyone to pass the Sunday law, you know, to, to hunt down and kill Adventists. Um, our dead relatives are going to appear to us in visions and dreams and in real life. Satan will impersonate Christ. Demons will impersonate dead loved ones. And they're going to deceive us more and plunge us and convince us to pass the Sunday law to get rid of Adventists. And then that will ensue the time of trouble for them. And then, you know, Christ coming, etc. And so where they are concerned, any sort of communication and interaction with uh, the departed ones, dead people is spiritualism. It is wrong. It's an abomination. And it's one of their biggest gripes with the wider body of Christ who hold to a bipartite nature of man. You know, some of us view it as bipartite, some tripartite. I hang more on bipartite. We are at least a physical body and a non-material conscious spirit that survives the death of the body, etc. There are some who hold that we are, you know, body, uh, spirit, and soul. They make a distinction between the spirit and the soul, whereas, you know, I see soul and spirit as interchangeable. But what I'm saying is Adventist are hugely against any sort of interaction, whether dream, vision, literal, whatever, 
with those who would have departed. Any sort of uh, 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 seance or experience or dream or vision, they, it's demonic where they are concerned. Now, here's an interesting thing. Ellen White <clears throat> had one of these experiences with her dead husband. Again, I've read their defenses. They go through hoops. Oh, it was just a dream. You know, like Biggie, it was just a dream. And that, that, that's their biggest defense. And it wasn't real. Well, guess what? If you'll have the same experience today, they'll still condemn you for it. If you have a dream and you follow the directions of the dream that were given to you, they'll still condemn it. But because it's Ellen White, it's just a dream. She gets a pass. It can happen. <laughs> I tell you the standards, the flip-flopping, uh, the endless torturing, the endless uh, uh, gymnastics never ceases to amaze me uh, with these people. So, so here's, how, here's how it goes, brothers and sisters. James had died on August 6, 1881. James White was Ellen White's husband. And he was buried Saturday, August 13, 1881. <laughs> she wrote this letter four weeks after James's burial. Let me summarize the letter for you. Ellen was asking God for light. That means instruction or as the, you know, direction in regard to her duty. She dreamed she was sitting in a carriage and James was sitting at her left hand. Quote, she says he was very pale but calm and composed. Why, Father, I exclaimed, I am so happy to have you by my side once more. I have felt that half of me was gone. Father, I saw you die. I saw you buried. Has the Lord pitied me and let you come back to me again? And we work together as we used to? This is what Ellen White asked him. Let me continue with, 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 with the thing here. James explained to her that overwork had killed him. So James explained this to Ellen White. Overwork had killed him. Now, Ellen, he says, calls will be made as they have been, desiring you to attend important meetings, as has been the case in the past. But lay this matter before God and make no response to the most earnest invitations. Your life hangs, as it were, upon a thread. You must have quiet rest, freedom from all excitement and from all disagreeable cares. He then urges Ellen White to follow all of his instructions so that she, shouldn't, she wouldn't die before her time like he did. And then he instructs her to write a whole lot. And so this, after this now, her plagiarism multiplied exponentially. He instructs her to write a lot. Quote, well, said I, James, you are always to stay with me now and we will work together. So even though he was dead, Ellen White had this dream experience of, 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 of James. And she said, you will always stay with me now and we will continue to work together like before when you died. James said to her, he overstayed in Battle Creek and was overworked there. Then he tells Ellen, don't make the same mistake. And I quote, I awoke, she says, but this dream seems so real. Now you can see and understand why I feel no duty to go to Battle Creek for the purpose of shouldering the responsibilities in general conference. I have no duty to stand in general conference. The Lord forbids me. That is enough. This is what Ellen White says. The very thing that God forbids in scripture that Adventists condemn the wider body of Christ for, she experienced with her husband James, and she says it's God who gave these instructions, and she credits all of it to God. I kid you not. Tell an Adventist you have a similar experience today. If I ever tell them that, my, you know, my father died. I didn't know him. He died when I was a young boy. I was in Haiti. He's in the Bahamas. I, didn't, I never knew my dad. If I were to ever tell an Adventist that I had a dream or vision of my father, uh, we spoke, he looked like me, and he's telling me what he's seen in my life, and, and he gives me instructions, and I follow them, Adventists would, would condemn me to hell. Because I'm practicing spiritualism. But Ellen White did, did the same thing. She gets a pass. She credits God for it. God gets the blame. God gets the credit. So again, very, very, very questionable here. 
Now, here is something you will not find in any Adventist literature. You will not find in any of their apologetic work. You will not find anywhere. They do their best to keep things like this neatly stuffed away in the closet. But guess what? You know I'm going to read, I'm going to research, and I'm going to give the facts. And I will substantiate why I don't hold to Ellen White and her views on Adventism any longer. Ellen White's burial was very scandalous. Some of you may be hearing this information for the very first time. And that's because you're not going to find it as part of Adventist heritage. But here it goes. Her burial was a big scandal. Ellen White was buried on Saturday, July 24, 1915. Later that evening, her two sons, James Edson and Will William C. White, and some friends removed her body and kept it in a vault for over a month and then reburied her. Ellen White died. She was buried officially Saturday, July 24, 1915. Later that evening, and I can take my time with this Yeah, You need to hear this because some of you will be hearing this for the first time. Current, ex, former, you name it, whatever kind of Adventist you are, you, are, you may be hearing this for the first time. She was buried Saturday, July 25, 1915. Later that evening, her two sons, James Edson and William C. White, and some friends, they removed her body after her burial. And they kept it in a vault for over a month and then secretly reburied her. Where do I get this information from? <laughs> There's a book entitled Ellen Harmon White, American Prophet. It's written by more than 15 different auditor, editor, authors rather, and edited by Terry Dope Ahmad. Gary Land and Ronald L. Numbers. Ronald Numbers was the one who published um, Prophetess of Health in 1976, who caused, you know, started a big blow up expose with Ellen White. It's published, published in the United States of America by Oxford University Press 2014. And uh, the chapter where this information is coming from is chapter 16, entitled Death and Burial. Uh, and this is authored by T. Joe Willey. And he reveals the shocking, cultic, secret society-ish and clandestine activity of these two sons of Ellen White. Edson wrote this to Willie, the other brother, and I quote, There were some matters mentioned in your letter on September 17, which I have not answered. You asked in regard to mother's burial. I think I explained this to you fully, stating that we went to the grounds about three weeks after the funeral and we saw her placed in the grave that had been prepared for her. Of course, her face had changed considerably and yet she was preserved as well as I could expect. When we went to the cemetery, Sister Israel took me over in her auto and we were glad to meet Mr. and Mrs. R.C. Gardner, Mrs. E.B. Jones and Mrs. L.V. Barton. They are all our people and happened to be at the grave just at the time that the change was made from the vault to the grave. Everything went off smoothly and occupied but little time. Ten days later, Willie replied to Edson, In your letter of October 15, you tell me about the removal of mother's body from the vault to the grave. We also have the bill from the sexton. Ellen White was reinterred, that is, reburied August 26, 1915, 34 days after the official funeral and supposed burial. Burial. Why did her sons do this, brothers and sisters? The world may never know, but it seems very suspect, cultic, and scandalous. As a matter of fact, when you go into a, a little deeper into Ellen White's connection with um, secret societies and perhaps Freemasonry in her day and her sons and a lot of the Adventist pioneers, William Miller, etc. This may very well explain what is going on. This seemed to have been a Masonic ritual. As a matter of fact, you could Google it right now. Look up Ellen White Gravestone. 
and you will see it's an obelisk you will see it is an obelisk and an obelisk there was and is something that persons in secret societies are given as tombstones that they're, they're, they're buried under it shows ownership who owned them when they were when they were alive check it out for yourself just do some research on the obelisk very quickly brothers and sisters and you will see the occult nature of the obelisk right now ellen white and james are buried under an obelisk you know what walter white the the, the the sda conspiracy theorist walter white Go watch some of his presentations if you want to know everything there is to know about secret societies. And watch how much he will talk about the hand signs, the obelisk, and all the various buzz phrases and things. And who's involved and what's going on. <laughs> but guess what? Guess what, brothers and sisters? You will never see a single presentation where Walter White talks about the obelisk that is on Ellen White and James White Grave. Never. Persons have communicated with me that they have written to him about it no response to this day persons have challenged him on it no response to this day he's the adventist expert on secret societies i, I i've watched all of walter white series when i was an adventist spanning from his total onslaught series and some of walter white series have a, almost 40 different dvds and you better believe i watch every single one of them i used to rinse them when I was an Adventist evangelist, these little Sabbath sermons and whatever and Sabbath preachers couldn't feed me. That's how deep I was in Adventism and, and, and these things. It's the hard food like Walter White and the Jeremiah Davis and the Ivor Myers. The, the, the kooks of the kooks in Adventism were my favorite preachers. The Andrew Henriquez. Type them up on YouTube from Save to Serve. I'm not making these things up. The, the Jeff Pippingers and their materials. These are the things that I used to read and study. So, so Walter White's Total Unstopped, his, um, his um, series on, on, on science and faith, I watched all of them. His series about, in, in 2009 about Obama and all of the others, I watched every single one of them. I was a fanatic. Brian S. Newman, he's a, he used to work closely with Walter White. He's a former Adventist now. He challenged Walter White on all of these things. No response. As a matter of fact, Walter White would not even mention Brian Newman's name. In anything he refused he, he he's in denial brian has spoken to me personally and he has shared some stuff so guys like him they know the truth but they ain't they they ain't gonna tell you all the facts they ain't gonna put it out there these guys gotta keep people dumb they have to keep people ignorant they have to keep people in fear they have to keep people paranoid doug botchley is no different they have to keep them paranoid about the Catholic Church, secret societies, the Pope, Sunday churches, and Sunday laws. Every week, look at what they're talking about. They have to keep them paranoid to keep their jobs. But guess what? These guys actually know that what they are saying and teaching the people is absolute rubbish. Absolute rubbish. Walter White, the expert. Go watch him, man. Go, go watch Total Onslaught and look for the relevant... Um, um, Secrets Behind Secret Societies. Yes, that's the title of one of those um, um, presentations he did. And you'll see he go through and show you all the obelisk in, in, um, in Washington, D.C., in, in London, in the Vatican, and wherever they are. And he'll explain to you what they mean. He'll talk about all the Albert Pikes. I was deep in these things. All the Helena Blavatsky's, the Alistair Crowley's. He'll talk about everyone, the Anton LaVey's who were a Satanist. And all of these hand signs and symbols and what they mean and these architectural designs and what they mean. He has whole lectures on that. But Walter White will never tell anyone there is an obelisk on top of James and Ellen White grave. And it means the same thing for them as it does for these other people I'm telling you about. <laughs> Check it out for yourself. Look up Ellen White gravestone and you'll see an obelisk right there. It's a phallic symbol. It's a symbol of secret societies. So, 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 so it's this sort of burial and then secret uh, uh, exhumation and then examination of her and whatever is, is very suspect. Secret societies practice these kinds of stuff. 
Guess what, brothers and sisters? Just in case you thought that this was only done to Ellen White, this was also done to James White, her husband, who had died in 1881. And it's very likely Ellen White was involved in it or knew of it. The same thing was secretly done with James Body in 1881. And Ellen White may have been knowledgeable about it and consented to it. William H. Hall, chief steward of the Battle Creek Sanitarium, made an entry for August 23, 1881. James was supposedly buried on the 13th of August. Here's what he says, and I quote, Tonight I went to James Edson White and others to Oak Hill Cemetery, and we moved the remains of Elder White from the vault to the grave. We opened the casket and took a last look until the morn of the resurrection. Rest in peace, war one soldier. Sleep on. End of quote. The very same thing that they did with Ellen White, they had done with her husband a couple decades before. Very suspect, my brothers and my sisters. Very, very suspect. Now, when you put it together and all the secret society language she was like, like the all-seeing eye of Jehovah, even their, their, their graphics and image at that time had the Masonic M and all-seeing eye in a triangle. Again, watch Walter Veit first, that Adventist preacher. Watch him first. Look him up on YouTube, Walter Veit. Dr. Walter Veith. Watch him first. Walter J. Veith. Watch him first. Then watch the Ellen White stuff and go back and type up, look up Ellen White and Secret Society Connection and you'll see what you need to see. She borrowed a lot of stuff from Helena Blavatsky, the Russian spiritualist. It seems very likely she was a part of Secret Society herself. There was this Adventist guy, and I'm just uh, paraphrasing from memory now. He was a part of the Masonic Lodge as well as an Adventist elder. He was... Um, spending more of his time in the lodge and pushing a lot more money in the lodge than he was doing in the church. And Ellen White claimed, you know, that God revealed all of this to her and she pulled him aside and had a talk with him. And while she was talking, she did some Masonic hand signs. And that's what was able to convince him that she's a prophet and that, well, that she's true, you know, and right. And what she said and he needs to sever his ties with the Masonic Lodge and be dedicated to the Adventist Church. Now, given what I know about Ellen White, El Ellen White was a con artist. Every time she's saying, I saw and the Lord show me is people bringing news to her and she's telling about other people and passing it off as God show her. And when she say, I saw and envision and stuff, she's plagiarizing other people's work. That's what she was doing. Given the way she operated, she either got that information and learned the hand signals from somebody else or she herself was a part of the lodge and knew those hand signals and to do them to convince that brother. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of pictures with Ellen White and the early Adventist pioneers. You will see them with their, their, their hand in their bosom. That was a Masonic um, hand signal back then. They took in photographs. Again, go watch Walter White, Secrets Behind Secret Societies. You'll see how we methodically and meticulously go through all that. And then compare all of that now to Ellen White and the early Adventist pioneers. And you're going to see that it's very likely, highly likely, that she was a part of that foolishness. And that's where she got all of these visions and this perfect cult from. To now keep people's soul in bondage and um, um, antithetical and averse to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what I believe. Now, here's the thing, brothers and sisters. By November 1974, Arthur L. White, he's a grandson of Ellen White, of James and Ellen. He became aware of these questionable and scandalous letters and what the rituals they performed on his grandparents. He personally read them and checked the cemetery records and confirmed the, their authenticity, but he covered it all up. Right now in mainstream SDAism, no one knows about this burial scandal of James and Ellen White. No one on these secret, apparently Masonic rituals. No one. Arthur L. White knew of all of these. He authenticated everything, but he covered it all up. He was also at the time writing the sixth volume biography on his grandmother, and he deliberately left out all of that information, lest it cause a shaking in the Adventist church. 
Some of you may be hearing this from me now for the first time. That's with good reason because they have it, it's a it's a neatly and well hidden secret among some of the top leadership. Just in case you are curious again as to where I get this information from, it's a well researched book. The book is titled, and you can find it on Amazon. The book title is Ellen Harmon White, American Prophet, written by about 15 different authors. It's um chapter 16. On her death, on her burial, you'll see where they document uh, this stuff. Let me close, brothers and sisters, with two statements from Ellen White herself. Ellen White herself. I don't even need to go to the Bible to tell you to stay away from her. I'll let Ellen White tell you to stay away from Ellen White. How about that? <laughs> I'll let Ellen White tell you to stay away from Ellen White. In Testimonies, Volume 4, page 229, paragraph 2, Here's what she says. God does nothing in partnership with Satan. I agree. My work for the past 30 years bears the stamp of God or the stamp of the enemy. You know exactly which one I, I go with. It's the stamp of the enemy. Her work bears the stamp of the enemy. They could have fooled Walter Martin. They could have fooled Donald Gray Barnhouse and all of the others who, who didn't know better or for whatever they fooled them. They can't fool me. Y'all ain't gonna fool me. She says, and I continue, there's no half work in the matter. The testimonies are either of the spirit of God or of the devil. Ellen White says it's not, it, it, it can't be mixed. It's either one or the other. And thank you, Ellen White. I believe your work was of the devil. And that's why I renounced you. I renounced Adventism. And I'm a born again Christian today. I made that decision five years ago. Lost everything. And I'll do it all over again as much as is necessary. Because her life and ministry and works and theology, it contradicted everything in scripture. It is absolute nonsense. And I don't want no parts with it. Here's another quote from her own mouth. Testimonies, volume 5, page 691, paragraph 2. She says, if the testimonies speak not according to the word of God, reject them. And that's exactly why I've rejected Ellen White. So for all of you Adventists who are watching, this is why I reject Ellen White. The Adventist Defense League are hard on my back right now, the Edwin Cottos. <laughs> if you all didn't know why I reject Ellen White, this is why I reject her. Because her work are not in accordance with the word of God. I reject them. And I'll do it all over again to just stand on the Bible alone. And church, history, orthodox Christianity. Yeah, that, that's where I'm at. She says, if they don't speak according to the word of God, reject them. And from what I've presented on these three presentations on her alone, you see clearly they don't speak in accordance to the word of God. The many of you who are former Adventists who have been in all your lives. I was in for what, 10 years? Some of you were in for 20, 30 years, 40 years. I have some friends who were in for 50 and 60 years, their entire lives in Adventism. And eventually the Spirit of God brought them out. The gospel reached them and they came out. And they are experiencing liberty in Jesus. They are experiencing salvation right now in Jesus. You know her work were not of God. They were of the devil. Where she says, if that's the case, reject them. And she says, as I finish this quote, Christ and Belial cannot be united. Let me read it over. Testimonies, volume 5, page 691, paragraph 2. If the testimonies speak not according to the word of God, reject them. And that's exactly why I reject them. They don't speak according to the word of God. Christ and Belial cannot be united. She's absolutely right. And that's exactly why. Me, Elsa Jr., Thunder Lauriston is not an Adventist today. And I'll do it all over again because Ellen White was not a true prophet of God. She needs to be discarded. And it's unfortunate that she's the foundation of the faith of almost, well, 18 plus or minus million people worldwide. It's unfortunate. It's very unfortunate. So having said that, brothers and sisters, this is where I stop for tonight. Let me thank you all for joining me. Look like you had a lot of fun. Look like you learned a lot and I'm grateful for it. And of course, 
pass this around. Share the presentations, man. A lot of people don't know these things. They need to be aware of, of what really is the underbelly of Adventism and why they need to stay away and stick with their Bible alone. Be an Orthodox Christian alone and know Jesus for themselves. Stay far from it. Stay far from the cult. Stay far from Ellen White. It's dangerous to your soul. It's dangerous to your spiritual and social life. Stay far. And I hope that I would have made this clear by what I presented from the multiplicity of sources, Adventists and otherwise, that I presented. All right, so I'm done for now. Until next week. Let me just see if any of you have any questions uh, real quick that you probably want me to answer. As I, as I close, I see you are having a lot of interactions in the chat, and that's wonderful. I'm happy for that. It shows that you are engaged with the uh, information. Those of you who joined me late, thank you very much for taking your time to come and to, you know, scope out this uh, presentation. Um, when I end the live, though, you can just, you know, watch the replay to catch everything. Um, but thanks for joining nonetheless. I see a whole lot of you having some wonderful conversation there. Um, any questions for me, anyone, quickly before I am, um, end this live? Any questions, anything you want to ask or anything you want me to clarify uh, quickly before I end? You know, I don't want to keep you long at all. These three, four only went a little longer because of the nature of them. But uh, as I finish with the historical aspect, I'm just going to be, you know, um, deconstructing the, the popular mindset uh, tech proof text and you know theology and that kind of stuff and that that should stick within the you know 45 minutes or less time frame um, that I initially set for these presentations uh, all right so uh, uh, th there's nothing God bless you Jason Booth God bless you big bro I'm happy that um uh, y'all y'all learning a lot from these man sister Don all the way from Australia God bless you former Adventist as well uh, brother David Rozelle God bless you I'm glad you enjoy them Apostle Spencer Great, great. Watch the replay. You'll definitely um, learn a lot. And if you didn't catch the previous ones, guys, um, I post these on YouTube. So you can just check me out on YouTube, subscribe to my channel, hit the not notification bell so that as I post something, you'll see it. Uh, EJ Thunder Larson, that's the YouTube channel. So you can just check it out. And you can watch all the other presentations I've done before on this issue or otherwise. And great sermons, you know, are on there as well. Uh, if you don't want the apologetic aspect, there are biblical teachings, there are debates, you know, so you could just um, check them out and you never know what you learn or what questions they might answer for you. Uh, so check them out. Uh, Amos Campbell is asking, is Sunday worship the mark of the beast? I'm going to specifically teach on that, uh, Amos, but the quick answer I could give to that is no. Sunday worship is not the mark of the beast. Worshiping God on Sunday is not the mark of the beast. But I am going to have the proper structured teaching on that issue as well. Um, you know, coming up. Perhaps I may do it next week. Who knows? Because I don't have anything else. So I'm just free now to just, you know, do topics. So maybe next week I may just do, um, if Sunday worship is the mark of the beast for you, do a series on that and hopefully you'll catch that. And if you don't catch the live, check out the, um, the YouTube channel. All of those are, are there. I have a lot of stuff up there already about the Sabbath and Sunday worship and scripture, early history. Check them out. You know, a lot of wealth of information on Sabbatarianism there. On my channel so check it out you can watch a lot of these things um as a as, as a, um in preparation for you know the mark of the beast thing i've not done uh, a teaching on the mark of the beast itself yet you know just allusions to show that it's not but i'm going to show from scripture revelation 13 and then other things you know history uh that it it can't be it it can't ever be wrong and sinful to worship god on any day you know it it, it can't be the worst thing you could possibly do it's to worship God on Sunday, and then that's going to send you to hell. That, just the thought of it is absolute nonsense. <laughs> but I'm going to prove it, right? Uh, that is not, all right? So, so just stay put for that presentation more in-depth uh, coming up. All right, uh, uh, what, what else What else? y'all want to ask? Let me, let me scroll through to see if there's any more question. Has the LCA cult grown, uh, SDA cult grown over the years around the world? Um, good question, Sister Hannah, all the way from Bahamas there. Um, in developing countries, and what I mean by that is countries like Jamaica, like Africa, like Haiti, where persons have limited access to information, where there is strong tribalism, um, Adventism, it grows. 
And that's because at, for Adventism, the information is filtered through the conference and the pastor and the elders. So it's filtered information. People only get the information that the leadership gives them. And they are very loyal to the tribe. So in those places, it has grown and it, 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 it grows fast. For example, in two weeks, the likes of Doug Batchelor and Mark Finley could drop a crusade anywhere, Rwanda anywhere, and they may baptize up to uh, 80 to 100,000 people in two weeks' evangelistic campaign. And that's because in those parts, it's very rustic village life, you know, life is very basic for people, no access to the internet, and some of these people aren't educated, and they, 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 they are not critical thinkers. So within two weeks, they baptize almost 100,000 people. And this is something they brag about. Check it out on the internet. It's on the internet too. They brag about it. But guess what? Uh, Adventism started in America in the 1840s, right? Officially organized in 1863. And between Canada and America, that's, that's North America, the membership is, it's a little over one million. And it's dwindling. <laughs> Why is that? Information. Access to information. Now, is this startling? Of course it is. Why? The U.S. population is over 360 million people. Canada is another, what, 40 to 50 million? I'm not so sure of the exact number, but somewhere thereabout. So in a population with over 400 million people, Adventism has been there almost 200 years. The membership is a little over 1 million and dwindling. Why is that? Information, critical thinking, education, access to information. Africa and those places... The membership large. The bulk of its membership is actually in developing countries. Adventism has been in Greece from 1905. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has been in Greece from 1905. That's more than 100 years ago. Guess what the membership is? If you think it is 1 million, that's too much. You're wrong. As a matter of fact, if you think it's 1,000, <laughs> you're wrong. If you think it's 800, you're still wrong. The Adventist membership in Greece right now, currently, the last time I checked was 450 people. It might be 500 now. Might be. And out of that, majority of them are not even Greek natives. Majority of them are migrant Africans who came as Adventists. Why is that the case? Well, you see, the Greeks, they are very strong in, in, in history. The Greek Orthodox Church is very strong and large there. It has been there from the first century AD, from the days of the apostles. The Greek Orthodox Church has been there. And there's this little pesky fact that Greeks read their Bible in Greek. It's their language. And Greek is a big enemy of Adventism. They just can't convince the Greeks that um, Sunday is Satan's day. Sunday belongs to the Catholic Church. You know why? Because whereas Sunday is Sunday in English for us, for Greeks and countries closely uh, uh, influenced by Christianity from the first century, the name for the first day of the week of, in their language is actually the Lord's Day. In Greek, it is Kuriaki. That's the name for Sunday in Greek. Kuriaki, it means the Lord's Day. Now, here's this little interesting fact. Read Revelations 1.10 in the Greek. You will see when John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. The Greek there, Egenomen ente pneumati ente hemera kuriaki. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, Sunday. And when you check the Latin, when you check Russian, when you check uh, 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 so many other languages, Spanish and French, the name for Sunday is the Lord's Day and not Satan or Catholicism's Day, as Adventists say. It's not pagan Sunday worship. And so they're not able to convince the Greeks that their biblical faith is wrong. And Adventism that just came around in the 1840s is right. And they need to throw away the apostolic faith and hang on to Adventism now. So in developed educated countries, Adventism is almost non-existent. Remember I said earlier, in two weeks in Africa, they'll baptize almost 100,000. 
in Eastern Europe, Ukraine and Czechoslovakia and Russia and those places, if they baptize five people for the entire year, they've had a good year. <laughs> I got receipts, guys. I can send you the news articles. They have to try creative ways like gambling and raffling to try to get people in the church and to try to baptize them in those countries. Why is it so hard for them there? Access to information, education, critical thinking. In a lot of those languages, the name for Sunday is Kuriaki, the Lord's Day in their respective languages. As a matter of fact, in Russian, the name for Sunday, Voskresenye, uh, that means Resurrection Day or Resurrection of Jesus. So they can't convince the Russians that you're pagans for worshiping Jesus on Sunday. And Sunday is the pagan Sunday worshiping day. Because it means Resurrection Day. And Russians can trace the history close to the first century. So in countries like Jamaica and developing countries where people are poor and there is little to no access to information and the information is filtered through the pastors and the leaders, yes, it's growing. But that's a big problem for them too because where the wealth is, the people are leaving. And eventually, and some pastors have said this to me, where the bulk of the membership is, that's the poorer nations. They say, boy, uh, uh, bananas and plantains and vegetables and goats can't sustain this megalithic structure. The, the general conference, it, it can't sustain it. And so it's, it's going to cause a huge, huge thing. And so that's what's up. That's what's up, um, Sister Hannah. I hope that would have <laughs> answered your your, your um, 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 question and given you more information than you bargained for. Uh, anybody else, just before I close, I really need to close here. You know, y'all know I don't like to keep y'all long, but y'all seem to be really reveling in this um, sort of information. But I got a whole lot more coming, guys. Um, I can take my time and I can deconstruct. They're always calling on Christians to answer to their thing and prove them wrong. And they are irrefutable on everything. Well, Medea, Tondadea, Tondadea. I'm doing these videos. I'm writing books. I'm doing interviews. You name it. Check out the facts for yourself. And of course, they're going to attack my character, my personality, and my style of delivery. So what? So what? Deal with the facts, man. Don't argue against the man. Argue against the facts. That's what it's about. Okay, uh, uh, let me see. Let me see how many Australia are here baptized. Well, I'm not particularly sure of that information since the dawn. Perhaps you could have given me that. Um, I'm just speaking off air, off, 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 off air here, you know, off um, my head, top of my head from what I recall. I haven't checked for Australia, but you're in Australia. You probably could have looked that up and tell me, man, rather than asking me. <laughs> so I'm not particularly sure of that one. Uh, uh, I see no more questions. I see um, um, Omar Nick is saying, it is also quite interesting to know the type of people they baptize in the States in recent times, a very specific socioeconomic and educational demographic. Uh, that's a very good point, and you live there so you can tell me. Um, a lot of those people indeed are usually, um, if I'm not mistaken, persons from the Caribbean. And yeah, I mean, I don't want to, you know, speak a certain way, but but yeah, that, that's a that's a valid point. And so, the, the 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 roosters will come home to roost. You know, all this braggadociousness about they are they are everywhere and their their message is flying high. There's a lot of things that are not adding up that's gonna come back to haunt them. Like the fact that, you know, within three months, one out of every two people they baptize is gone. Yeah, th these things, these things are, are going gonna, are gonna to come back, you know. They can't keep covering these stuff about Ellen White and all, all the mess in the, in, for too long. It's going to come back. All right, everybody. So y'all take care. Have a good evening. I love y'all. Keep digging. Keep studying. Keep researching. Keep fact checking all of these things. And I pray that you'll be liberated. As I share these things and you stay away, stay away from these prophets, stay away from these cults, stick to the word of God alone. Contextual exegesis, find the solid biblical teachers, because there are a lot of koof out, koofs out there too where, where word of faith is concerned and all of that. So they, they are out there and there are other apologists who deal with those. You know, there are a whole lot of other apologists and friends of mine who deal with those. This is my specialty, so I focus on this. Stick to the word of God alone. May God continue to bless y'all. 
And thank you for riding with me on this journey as we deconstruct Adventism. Have a good evening, guys. God bless you all.